Hello again, sweet friends. Here is chapter 15 from Karen Cushman's The Midwife's Apprentice. And chapter 15 is titled Edward. Here we go. The manor was growing quiet, preparing for evening and supper in bed. Alice passed men coming back from the fields, weed hooks and hoes and rakes on their tired shoulders. Dairy maids washing out the churn, stopping every now and then to lift the sweet butter off their fingers. Shepherds bringing in the sheep for tomorrow's washing and shearing. The music of their pipes rising to the wide blue sky and disappearing into the silence. Around the barn in the hen house, she found Edward, egg basket still empty, kneeling before the chickens. So then, he said to the largest and most bad-tempered, you be the king and you, he pointed to a small hen with speckled feathers, be the queen, for you look motherly and kind, and the rest of us will be knights, and we will pretend we are about to have a great battle with the Scots, but we don't mind, for we are sure to be victorious. Well, at that, Edward looked up and saw Alice watching him. Alice, he cried, leaping to his feet, the better to throw his arms around her waist. Alice, you've not forgot me. Alice remembered her imaginings as the boy hugged her, and she smiled. It would be well. Come, Alice, you can be a knight too, and we will march north to the stable. Edward, I sent you here to work so you'd have food and warmth and a place to belong, and instead you're, you're playing knights with the chickens. What were you thinking? She tweaked Edward's nose and pulled a speckled feather from his hair. Come, I'll help you find enough eggs to satisfy the cook, and then we will talk together. Alice, what you be doing at the manor? I came to see how you be, and good thing I did, for it seems you have not the wits of an oat. Your sister, indeed. What are these lies you've been telling the cook? Not really lies, Alice. I just wanted a sister, for all cook's other children have brothers and sisters. Have you come to take me away? Before Alice could reassure him that she was there to rescue him and all would be well, he continued. Well, you haven't, have you, Alice? For I am sore content here and mostly have enough to eat, and when cook is cross with me, I sleep with the chickens and pretend. No one chases me away, and even Lord Ar Arnolf, <laughs> Lord Arnolf knows my name. So Alice learned about the sometimes mighty distance between what one imagines and what is. She would not be bringing Edward back with her to make her heart content, but she knew she had not failed him, and she breathed a heavy sigh of sadness, disappointment, and relief. It felt so good that she did it again and again until her sighs turned to sobs and she cried her first crying right there in the hen house with Edward arming the chickens for battle. Edward patted her shoulders and hands and comforted her as well as a small boy could and cheered her by wiggling his loose front tooth. Remember how in past chapters, Alice would always talk about this stinging feeling she'd get in her eyes and like a stingy feeling she'd get in her throat and like a tight feeling she'd get in her chest because she wasn't one that would ever cry. We talked about how she'd always been through so much her whole life. It was as if um, she could never really turn on that crying switch to just release whatever sadness she was feeling. But now it seems like that's happening for the first time. She imagined Edward begging her to like save him and bring him back from the manor. In a way, I think she feels close with um, Edward. Um, so now showing up and finding that he's actually pretty content, she's relieved to hear that he's content and happy, but also kind of sad that he's not begging her to like take him away. So she's feeling a mixture of emotions right now. On the way back to the kitchen, Edward began a campaign to convince Alice to stay the night, and she agreed, though she knew Jeanette would scold her for her absence, for she was not ready yet to completely abandon Edward in her rosy imaginings. Well, they ate their breakfast, bread and bacon supper, while Alice helped Edward mound up straw in a corner of the kitchen, while she sat by watching for him to go to sleep, all the while, all the while Edward talked of life on the manor. He told her of the silken-robed lords and ladies who came for feasts and rode out to hunt and dance like autumn leaves in the candlelit great hall. He told her of the visiting knights who clanked their swords against each other as they practiced in the schoolyard. Of the masons who slapped mortar and bricks together to build a great new tower at the corner of the hall that looked to stretch near all the way to heaven. 
He described the excitement of the buying and the selling of the great autumn horse fair, the nervous preparations accompanying the arrival of some velvet shod bishop or priest, and the thrill of watching the baron's men ride out to confront a huge maddened boar who'd roamed too close to the village. And he complained at his lot, doing all the smallest tasks, not being allowed to help with the threshing and plowing, being teased for being so little and frail and tied to cook skirts and fit for nothing but gathering eggs. Finally, as his eyes looked near to closing, he said, Tell me a story, Alice. I don't know any stories. Oh, for sure you do. Everyone does. Well, Jeanette told me that one night a visiting mayor fell out of his bed, hit his head, and thought he was a cat, so he slept all night on the floor watching the mouse holes. That's no story, Alice. Cook tells me stories. A story should have a hero and brave deeds. Well, well then, okay. Once there was a boy who, for all he was so small and puny, was brave enough to do what he must, although he didn't like it, and he was sometimes teased. Who do you think she's talking about? Is that a story? Close enough, Alice. And he closed his eyes. When the moon shone through the misty clouds and two owls hooted in the manor yard, Edward and Alice slept, each comforted by knowing the other was safe and warm and sheltered and not too very far away. The next day being the day the woolly black-faced sheep were washed before shearing, Alice and Edward ate their bread and beer breakfast down by the river to watch the great event. Edward finished his breakfast first. I'm still hungry, Alice, and there's nothing about here to eat but grass. Do you know if the grass is good for people to eat? Try it. He did. It'd be good for exercising my teeth and making my mouth taste better, but it tastes like grass, I would say. Then do not eat it. What is the best thing you ever ate, Alice? Hot soup on a cold day, I think. Once long ago, a monk gave me a fig. It was a wonderful thing, Alice, soft and sweet. And after that, I had nothing to eat for three days but the smell of the fig on my fingers. Are you ever going to finish that bread, Alice? And Alice gave him her bread, which is what Edward wanted and Alice intended all along. Part of the river had been dammed to form a washing pool. Men stood in the waist deep water while the hairy shepherds um, looking much like the sheep themselves, drove the woolly beasts into the water to have their loose fleeces pulled off and then be scrubbed with strong yellow soap. The river was noisy with the barking dogs, the bleeding of sheep, the calling and cursing of men, and the furious bawling of those lambs separated from their mothers. Edward soon took on the job of matching mothers and babies. He snatched up the bawling lambs and ran from mother to mother until he made up the right pair, whereupon they would not come out of the way in their hurry to nuzzle each other. As the day grew hotter, the river looked cooler, and finally Alice tucked her skirt up into her belt and waded in. The weary men were glad of another pair of hands and soon had Alice helping. First she held the woolly black faces while they were scrubbed, but one old ewe took offense at Alice's handling and standing up with her front feet on Alice's chest, pushed the girl into the water. Alice, coughing and sputtering, traded jobs with the man who was lathering their backs. Fleeces clean, the sheep swam to the bank and scrambled out of the water, nimble as goats and hungry as pigs. By mid-afternoon, they were finished. While Edward and the shepherds drove the sheep to their pens across the field, Alice stretched and wiped her wet hands on her wet skirt. What a wonder, she thought, looking at her hands. How white they were and how soft. The hours of strong soap and sudsy fleece had accomplished what years of cold water never had. Woo! Oh, I had a spider. <laughs> I had a spider on me. I don't know why I just flung it off now. I don't know where it is. Oh, I'll find him later. We'll finish the chapter. Uh, what a wonder, she thought, looking at her hands. How white they were and how soft. The hours of strong soap and sudsy fleece had accomplished what years of cold water never had. Her hands were really clean. There was no dirt between her fingers, around her nails, or ground into the lines of her palms. She sat back against a tree, held her hands up before her, and admired them. Oh, how clean they were, how white. Suddenly she sat forward. Was the rest of her then that white and clean under all the dirt? Was her face white and clean? Uh, was Will Russet right? Was she even pretty under the dirt? There never had been one pretty thing about her, just skinny arms and big feet and dirt, but lately she had been told her hair was black and curly and her eyes big and sad, and she was mayhap even pretty. Remember, mayhap means perhaps. Alice looked about. The washing was done and the sheep driven to the barn to dry off for tomorrow's shearing. The river was empty, but for great chunks of the greasy yellow soap floating here and there. 
Alice found a spot a bit upriver from the befouled washing pool, pulled off her clothes and waded in. She rubbed her body with a yellow soap and a handful of sandy gravel until she tingled. Squatting down until the water reached her chin, she washed her hair and watched it float about her until she grew chilled. Alice stood up in the shallow water, looked at herself, much cleaner, although a bit pink and wrinkled from her long soak. And pretty? Mayhap even that, for she had all her teeth and all her limbs, a face unmarked by pox or witchcraft, and perhaps now more of happiness and hope than of sadness in those big eyes that even the midwife had remarked on. She washed her clothes, pulled them on still wet and drippy, and ran for the kitchen to dry a bit before the fire. Too soon it was time to bid Edward goodbye. Be assured, I will not be far from here, and I promise to come back for Christmas and Easter and your saint's day, and to see what that front tooth grows in again, or when that front tooth grows in again. Edward grinned. He had enjoyed the day, done a man's job, and been carried home on the shoulders of a giant of a sheep herd called he Shepherd. <laughs> sheep herd. Is that where shepherd comes from? Sheep herd, shepherd. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> He was satisfied with his place at the manor, the devotion of the cook, and the friendship of Alice. He suddenly felt not so small. Alice gave him a hug and a smack and felt that tickling in her throat and the stinging in her eyes that meant she might cry again. Now she knew how to do it. She went down the path from the manor, stopping every few steps to turn and wave until finally the path curved and Edward was lost from sight and all she could see was the way ahead. That's the end of chapter 15. Chapter 16 will be next.